mental health and wellness. And on this panel, we have four panelist members. The first is Nathaniel Counts, who is the Senior Policy Advisor for Mental Health to the Commissioner of Health and Mental Hygiene for the City of New York. Dr. Stella George, who is Chief Medical Officer for International Health at Sigma Healthcare. Dr. Devora Kestel, who is the Director of Mental Health and Substance Abuse at the World Health Organization. And Professor Miranda Wolpert, who is the Director of Mental Health at Wellcome Trust. Please welcome the panelists to the stage. Hey, thank you for being with me, everyone. Um, I'm excited to get into this big topic. As we were just hearing about, it's, it's one that's getting worse and that we need to focus on strategies to solve. Um, I can't help but notice that this panel is coming at a really crucial time. Tomorrow, um, the United Nations high-level meeting on universal health care is happening. And yet, 75% of countries have not fully integrated mental health into their health systems. So it's clearly something we need to talk about. This is despite the fact that many mental health conditions can be solved at a low cost. So I want to speak to the panel today about how the world can come together to broaden access to quality and affordable mental health care. And I especially want to dig in on that intersection of mental health and universal health care. Dr. Castell, I wanted to start with you and draw on your 25 years of experience in implementing and advising governments on national policies related to mental health systems. Given a large percentage of countries have yet to fully integrate mental health into their health systems, what are the barriers to getting this up and how might these be addressed by policy decisions in country? Great, thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, for those who don't see, we have the time uh, in front of us, and I wonder <laughs> if I can use it all to answer to, to this question that is broad and, and, and very important. We, we you know, from, from the World Health Organization perspective, we do have countries uh, committed to advance mental health, and this is part of an action plan that was endorsed by all member states. But what, what we see is that they really struggle in making that happen. Uh, the the um, a real integration of mental health in the mainstream of, of the health sector is what is lagging behind. And the barriers are many and depending on the countries we are talking about. But in general, we know that only 2% of the health budget goes to mental health and uh, public uh, health budget. And that is, of course, very little money when you need to uh, provide answer to the diversity of situations that are related to mental health needs. Uh, furthermore, in many countries, around uh, 60, 70 percent of that, 2 percent, goes to old-fashioned psychiatric institutions, and there is nothing there for community care. So um, that's one clear barrier, financial issues. Another important barrier is uh, information. We, the countries don't know exactly what is uh, the situation. There is very limited information that is being collected on a regular basis by health practitioners, and that information collected may end up being in a notebook, never ending at the level of decision makers. So that's another important uh, gap. As a consequence of all this, there is a treatment gap. There is no, people do not receive care when they need it. Mm. And we are talking about between 50 and 90 percent of people with mental health issues not getting access to care quality uh, care, etc. And a big component of this is a stigma. Stigma is still very important. When you said in the introduction that uh, um, the problem is growing, and I always, yes, it grows significantly as an immediate consequence of COVID-19, but it, does, it is also true that we are talking more, we are hearing more about that. So in some contexts, in some countries, stigma is going down, and so we, we, we see more of those uh, situations. But that's not global. Stigma is still a very important uh, component. So strategies to overcome all that are uh, diverse depending on which one of the gaps we want to, 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 to work or, or to deal with. Definitely the integration of mental health at primary care level, at uh, the level of specialist care for other uh, um, conditions, uh, uh, comorbidities, the issue of considering mental health when talking about uh, life course approach from ch children to maternal health to 
uh, different issues uh, uh, according to the age. So not only when, it, when it's about a disease, but also when it's about life. Yeah. And, um, and then those are some of the strategies that should help in reviewing and reforming the way uh, services have been uh, historically organized and structured is uh, also uh, needed at this stage if we want to make sure that mental health is seen as the slogan says, there is no health without mental health. So as one more part of a human being that needs yeah. an answer to many things, among them also to mental health. Thank you for setting the stage there. Um, and I'm, I would like to return to the issue of stigma and how to address that through policy solutions more, because it's clearly a huge issue. Um, Professor Wolpert, let me come to you, though, first. I'd like to hear from you about having heard about these barriers, about the intersection between scientific research and policy making. Um, I want to get this right. You said your target is by 2032, there should be at least one new pharmacological intervention, one new non-pharmacological intervention, and one new digital digital intervention available and in use. What can governments do to help get us there? Thank you. Well, thank you for having me here. So I think we're at a tipping point in terms of mental health science. So I think we don't often hear the, the terms mental health and science in one sentence. And we need to start having that as part of our core narrative. It needs to be up there with how we talk about what the opportunities are in terms of uh, mental health coverage. So what governments can do is help invest in that science as part of their investment in mental health. Um, at the moment, uh, the investment is less than 50 cents a head for uh, scientific innovation and development for mental health problems, which are holding billions of people back across the world. We need to change that, and uh, I have the privilege of being part of a, um, a philanthropy which is, is investing millions, hundreds of millions, in mental health science. I also have the privilege of seeing the exciting stuff that is coming through that is going to change the opportunities for integration in, in universal health care going forward. So we're already seeing new drugs coming. We have the first new drug for schizophrenia in 50 years that is coming through to the market within the next year. We have a, a new drug for postnatal depression also coming through. We have um, new non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions that are looking very promising with things around how we change our sleep, how we change our exercise, how we use digital tools to help support us in, in new and innovative ways. And for example, um, innovation around how you can predict when you are going to have a relapse uh, in terms of psychosis just by using your facial expression. So there are some very interesting digital tools arising. Um, and I think that there is a real opportunity for us to galvanize that and uh, change the way we think about what are the interventions we can do and the ways we can change people's lives. Well, wow, that's fascinating. Thank you. Um, Nathaniel Counts, you advise the Commissioner of Health for the City of New York um, on innovative financing policy and research strategies for achieving the city's mental health goals. As I bring you into the conversation, I'm wondering if you can tell us about the economic benefits of investing in mental health services and also how to integrate mental health into the larger health system of, of a city like New York. Yeah, I feel like the previous comment set it up well because financing and the need for investment was a really huge theme. Um, and I think sort of traditionally there's been this view that uh, investments in social protection, which I kind of think mental health is part of, and then economic growth and development, there's a trade-off between them. And we have to figure out how do we sort of balance this a classic efficiency equity argument. But I think what more recent economic findings show is that there isn't a trade-off. And in fact, like mental health, uh, especially from a life course perspective, is like a key factor in driving economic growth and development and a necessary part of it. Um, and so like one study in the US found that uh, for mental health conditions alone, it will be between 2015 and 2050, an estimated $18 trillion in lost GDP um, because of untreated mental health conditions. Um, and so you think about like the massive economic toll, and I think we see this like lots of studies have shown the economic benefits of investing in mental health. Um, but I think the big challenge is then going from these estimates of benefit to how do you build that into sort of like national accounting frameworks? How do you make that real for actual budgeting? Um, I think one of the difficulties is like for physical capital, I think we have pretty good systems. So you're gonna be able to sort of, you know, spread out the investment over the life of the asset. And that opens up these sort of innovative financing tools. Like if you're building a stadium or a new piece of infrastructure, you can issue bonds based on the expected property tax increases over time. And you have this idea that like we're making an investment and this is going to show up in real budgetary impacts and that unlocks financing and investment for us. In human capital, we don't really have that as a common a concept as much. Like all expenses occur that year and there's no benefit in the accounting over time. 
Um, and so I think some progress being made, is we, I think we're really seeing in like the climate space, there is this movement towards climate budgeting. So New York City and the U.S. as a whole and many other countries are participating in different climate budgeting exercises, um, which try to build these you know, sort of considerations outside of the standard accounting into the budget process. Um, and so, for example, in the Biden budget last year, they showed, like, here's the actual expected economic losses of an action from not acting on climate change. And then it goes from this sort of, like, cost-benefit analysis for different investments to, like, an economic imperative. Like, we have to do this to avoid trillions of dollars of loss. And so I think the extent we can think about how to align investments in human development, human capital, with the actual accounting and budgeting frameworks, um, it'll make the investment case real and then unlock innovative financing opportunities that aren't sort of like one-off contracts with like really high transaction costs that, challenge, that face difficulty scaling and that I think recognize the importance and magnitude of the issue. Do you have any examples um, in your own experience in New York and those kinds of innovative contracts that you've struck so far? So, I mean, in the past, I think there's been, I mean, there's a lot of different innovations that basically all have different versions of it. So there's been, you know, there's social impact bonds, there's just normal social bonds, which they look at certain uh, criteria beyond just sort of standard uh, return on investment for the financing. Um, but they're all sort of variations on the same theme that uh, value accrues over a longer timeline, and we need to sort of capture uh, the different ways that these externalities show up. And so I think there's a lot of different options, and I think the major challenge is streamlining it so that you can mobilize a lot of financing instead of one-off deals. Right. It's a matter of sort of rethinking how we measure it. Um, Dr. Stella George, I'd love to bring you in. As the Chief Medical Officer for International Health at Cigna, tell us how a company like Cigna approaches the integration of mental health in its healthcare packages. I know you're a big advocate for preventative mental health and that this is gaining traction as an, an important aspect of overall well-being. So how is Cigna thinking about promoting preventative mental health? So, in fact, I always joke that when you look at the whole healthcare ecosystem, we have providers, we have pharm pharmaceutical companies, and a lot of other players. The health insurance company is positioned in such a way that we are one of the most um, important stakeholders to prevent, to promote health and uh, prevention. Uh, if we keep our employer population healthy and have good health outcomes, we grow. So we are the most, we have uh, one of the most important stakeholder. And like my fellow panelists already spoke about how less is invested in mental health. And if you go and take it one step ahead, how much even from that little scant resources, even less is invested in health promotion and preventive act activities. And there are numerous studies we have seen in U.S. and Europe where every dollar we spend on health promotion and uh, prevention activities, we have 10 to 14 percent ROI, 14 times. But why then we don't do it? It's because of the same thing what Nathaniel said, that it's, it has a longer tail. It's not instant. We don't see. And plus, there are other bigger problems to solve. So it just gets pushed down at the bottom. And especially from a mental health, mental health is a common denominator right now. Issues. Everyone, in fact, Aryan was referring to um, a particular statistics about burnout, especially between 18 to 24 years uh, old, when we surveyed them, 98% of them have experienced burnout. So it's like normalized right now. Everyone has something or other so how do we take this into consideration? And that is where all our solutions is, whether it is services or solutions we build, takes a very integrated approach. We also know that if there are chronic condition and there is an underlying mental health issue, they tend to incur 30% more cost than people who don't have a mental health issue. And then there is also another uh, thing which complicates is the individual burden, burden to the family and the societal burden. Uh, we also have our employer group very concerned. Like today, number one priority for all our employer group is mental health. So we, everything that we do, it's like mental health screening or building resilience is part of all our clinical programs. In fact, all our frontline uh, staff, including clinicians, they are trained in mental health first aid. 
So they can screen. In fact, we even use some um, new innovation we are trying where even though sometimes we meet people and say, how are you? We say, I'm fine. We don't we don't yeah. say we are going through something. So there are actually analytics, speech analytics, which can know that, yeah, Stella is saying she's fine, yeah. but there's something but the way her heart rate is going. So there's so much innovation coming to detect that and helping people get the right resource to build resilience. So if your mental state, like your quality of your life is determined by your mental health. So if we can help in addition to your physical, <coughs> social, taking care of that mental aspect of mental well-being, I think it goes a long way in terms of even making changes to your behavior, health behaviors, which might have a positive outcome on health. So I would say it's completely integrated. We, we don't say this is our mental health yeah. solution. Yeah. I was struck by something you said, though, which is that because in, in, in large part mental health is maybe a more amorphous or, or life, life cycle problem, sometimes it falls to the bottom of the heap in terms of priorities um, for stakeholders involved. So I wondered if I could bring in um, uh, Dr. Kestel again um, and, and ask about that, that idea of how can we keep mental health as a top priority um, for, for governments and for multinationals? for multilateral organizations? Well, I would say, I'm not sure we could say how to keep it. I would start by bringing. Yeah, okay, <laughs> maybe that's better. How do you make the case? Okay, uh, I think that some of the um, figures and the information that we have are uh, relevant, right, to make the case. Um, the explicit, uh, continuous education information that could serve on, on one hand uh, to, to uh, recognize the problem, on the other hand to fight with stigma and, and to introduce measures that are not only to take care of those who are suffering or are going through mental health issues, but also in, in the workplace, for example, how to prevent mm -hmm. things to happen. And one of the key elements that we have identified to prevent uh, mental health issues to be developed in the workplace is to train managers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, that those are concrete uh, uh, interventions that should, should uh, happen and should bring. So I think that what we, we, last year we produced a report that tried to summarize all what we know right now uh, on mental health, including examples from a, a lot of countries that could help to bring this as concrete ways forward. Okay, this is your country, these are your resources, this is your capacity, these are your priorities. Let's find a way to bring mental health and maintain it there and keep it there, right? Mm -hmm. But to bring it as a priority. There are issues that could be done. Everybody can do things from the government point of view to take, care, uh, to take better care of the mental health of people. So let's bring them uh, up front and make sure that then are uh, systematized and, and, and be uh, part of the universal health coverage that we are all talking about. Yeah, so the answer is to think about prevention. Um, it's prevention, yeah. but it's also care and it's also promotion and it's also recovery. There is no, uh, uh, there is no way to, to think that we will prevent every mental health condition yeah. to ever come. No, we can prevent some. We can prevent uh, in the workplace. We can prevent uh, with interventions with, uh, at school uh, with children and adolescents. We can prevent suicide and with that a number of other issues happening. But we can't prevent mental health issues to happen. Completely. Yeah. So that is one important part. The second important part is what are the, the interventions, the, the new ones that uh, Miranda just mentioned, the, the ones that are there, and, and the different sectors that need to be involved, and the different stakeholders that need to be involved in order to take care of yeah. those issues. Yeah, Professor Wolford, I wondered if I could return to you on the question of stigma. Um, and what scientific innovation, what role can scientific innovation play in reducing stigma? So I think what we've learned from cancer, when I was growing up, cancer was called the big C, and people used to whisper about it, and they wouldn't say if someone had cancer. Because we now have effective treatments, that is completely gone. Stigma will disappear from mental health when people know there are effective treatments to help it. 
So although I am a great supporter of anti-stigma campaigns, and I think they are important, the biggest way we will smash stigma is having a way to treat the problem. Wow. I'd never made that connection before, but it seems key. St the stigma will disappear when there's effective treatments. Uh, Nathaniel, uh, can you speak to, to what you've been doing to reduce st stigma in New York? I was actually, as everyone was talking, I was reflecting on, like, I think, so what we've been doing in New York, I'll go to in a second, but I think one just sort of general trend um, that's been really helpful is just the focus on person-centered care and healthcare generally, to the point about, like, when we ask people how they're doing, do we, do they just say fine, or do we, like, sort of prompt more response? And I feel like as there is more of this movement towards person-centered care, you are getting, like, all across the healthcare system, uh, more and more sort of elevation of mental health as a core issue. Like I used to work in mental health advocacy. I remember sitting in a meeting once, um, and someone asked if anybody had a, like a you know policymaker had asked if anybody had comments, and someone raised their hand like, "Well, what about mental health? You left it out." And I was like, "I think I was supposed to say that." So I looked around. Who said that? It was one of the cancer organizations. Yeah. And I was like, "Oh, okay." So it like, sort of became very clear that like as people begin to listen more to the populations they serve as part of the standard of care, then like the sort of like base grows because mental health becomes so critical to every aspect of it. Nathaniel, could you just um, pause and define person-centered care? So I think the, one of the big transitions that undergoing healthcare is this movement towards um, sort of a model where someone comes in with a complaint and then you use your sort of like specialized medical knowledge to just address that specific complaint <clears throat> based on evidence-based guidelines versus taking the time to sort of like understand what their goals and values are and then creating treatment plans with them to achieve them. And I think it's sort of like a general ethos that I think is like sort of infused across yeah. all the many you know, all sorts of human services as well. Um, and to that point, this idea of like sort of like how do we fight stigma and integration, uh, in a lot of the briefing documents for the high level meeting, they mentioned this like whole of government approach. And I think in New York City, that is really one thing we get to enjoy uh, quite intensely. So our mental health plan came out um, some months back, and it was like a whole government approach where every agency had initiatives and programs and strategies involved, from parks to the libraries. And I think like as people take like you know have the time and space to listen to the people that are interacting with, like, mental health is coming up like everywhere, whether or not that's people know how to describe it. And it sets an expectation that like, okay, we've raised awareness, like now we need some place to send people to. And then increasingly you have this like massive coalition of agencies and partners who believe that mental health is core to the primary and overall yeah. healthcare delivery system. It actually reminds me of um, the conversation that we just had about the um, uh, combating AIDS and the importance of um, bringing together different agencies who are maybe even outside of healthcare who can help meet healthcare goals. Claire, I was wondering if there are any questions from the audience you'd like to share. Yeah, thank you, Amelia. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, so, Allison at the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C., is wondering if you all have any, you know, concrete ideas about our organizations can better accommodate mental health differences inside the workplace rather than relying purely on outside benefits programs. Talk to George, you might want to answer that. No, absolutely. I think there is so much opportunity because we do have that global infrastructure. In fact, one of the things where we can absolutely like take action is in terms of virtual health. And we saw in the pandemic, like people just switched to that. And to the earlier question about stigma, in certain geographies, it's still people don't go like, and tell openly that they are tick. But what we have seen, the shift has happened is the privacy and the confidentiality around accessing mental uh, health support, psychotherapy, or cognitive behavioral therapy virtually from the comfort and confidentiality of your home. So I think virtual health, not only for mental health, even access. I mean, earlier we talked about, like, there is also a number of mental health professionals. There is a gap in what is the need and what is actually there. So again, virtual health can play a big role in not only um, as a modality for people to reach out, but also in triaging, because not everything needs a psychiatrist. But So you can actually... You see what somebody might, it might be just loneliness, social isolation that is causing somebody to have mental health symptoms. So all they need might be a coach or somebody, and someone else might need a um, very specific action. So I think the partnership with organization like us, we can partner with government and um, um, large employer group 
to provide this infrastructure. In fact, recently, two weeks back, we are the partners for United Nations uh, and governmental organization. So when the crisis happened in Morocco and Libya, our crisis support team was immediately deployed in such a short time because people had to go and help. So this was a very valuable resource to triage and have access to care and also mental health, 24-7 support to someone in the language, local language. And it was very well received. And this is not only we offer it for our international plan, we also extend it to the nationals of that country. Even if they don't have insurance, still it's open to the whole national. So these are some examples where we have come and partnered with our employer and the local government to support, like <coughs> reinforce what the lack or just add uh, to the forces so that we can help more and more people. Javor, you want to tell Thank you. I wanted to comment a bit on, uh, and it's linked to a number of issues that have been said. We talk about people centered. We also talk about the human rights of people with mental health conditions. And I think that stigma, um, according to the Lancet Commission on Stigma and Discrimination from last year, uh, the contact with people with mental health conditions, direct contact is one of the main um, elements to fight stigma. And, and what I'm trying to say here is that we need to learn to accept that we are different and some people may live with mental health conditions with or without treatment. And they may have a happy life with or without uh, treatment, living with those conditions, if they find a situation that is comfortable to that. And that it contributes to, to, to stigma, but also is, is a way of, to fight stigma, sorry, but it's a way of uh, learning to accept that having a mental health condition is not something to be uh, ashamed of or yeah. afraid of. There should be treatment, and then there should be the possibility to decide what do you want to do with that. And uh, if we if we learn to accept that, then it could also be part of you don't you won't need to hide it in your workspace because of concern of the retaliation or, or the actions that might be taken because you have uh, right now today. Uh, very few people are able to say, I have a mental health condition yeah. to your employer uh, 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 immediately as something happens. Thank you so. for that. Yeah. Um, Miranda. I just wanted to come in to say there is a great report from the WHO on workplace mental health, which, re which really emphasizes the role of managers in terms of how they respond to people when they uh, arise mental health. Not that managers have to become therapists or have to become mental health experts, but just having a culture in which you can be talked about and supported and thought about actually can make a huge difference. It doesn't look that expensive or other. That sounds like a great resource. Thank you. We've got one question left um, for everyone. Really quickly, the upcoming UN high-level meeting on universal health care is happening tomorrow. I, I wondered if we could share what we hope will emerge from that gathering. It's an opportunity to make a specific call to the people who will be attending that. Maybe, Nathaniel, will start with you. Uh, I think the commitment to mental health with like a good developmental life course promotion uh, lens as part of primary health and universal health coverage. So for me, it would be to be uh, treat health insurance as partners because we have a lot of um, in support in terms of network or access to care, which we can absolutely supplement to make the universal health care a reality. Bringing in the partners for sure, Deborah. There is no health without mental health. There is not universal health coverage without mental yeah. health included. And Miranda. I think I'm just going to say plus one. To plus all one. Steps. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Am I going that way or just yeah. which way? This way. Yes. Thank you.